It's funny how when you plant a, a, a flower, if a flower doesn't grow, you don't think that there's something wrong with the flower. You look at the condition that the flower is grown in. But we, as people, we look at ourselves and think that we have problems, but we don't look at what we feed ourselves with. Give me an idea of the soil from where you come. I came from rocky soil, sandy soil, you know, nothing grows there. Uh, I came from good soil that got contaminated. So once the contamination got out, I got back on the right road. I came from a soil that's full of shot glasses and wine bottles. That's my youth. My parental soil was good and, and nourishing, but as a child, you don't, you don't really go by what your parents say. You want to move yourself to concrete, and you feel like you can do it your way, and you want to grow through concrete. So, you know, you, you live and you learn. Here's Paul Brody. Welcome to my feature, Growing Hope, the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Project. The original version of this piece was produced in German for the WDR radio station. We want to thank them for the support. The United States claims to be the land of the free. However, it leads the world in incarcerating its population. Over 2.2 million people in America live behind bars. I believe that cultivating creativity is the key to human transformation, to finding happiness. Can doing art help transform a person living in the harsh conditions of prison? I chose to visit Alabama. On one hand, it's well known for its problematic civil rights and justice system history. On the other, it harbors one of the most exemplary prison education programs in the United States, thanks to Kaya Stevens, who's driving me to her poetry class at the Elmore Correctional Facility. So going into the prisons and, and teaching in the prisons, I found people who, who had um, a very similar urgency in writing poetry that I had. And I wanted to stay, I wanted to be involved with that. Kaya Stevens grew up in Waverly, Alabama, Population 145. In the late 90s, she left for New York to attend Sarah Lawrence College and pursue an academic career. But after graduating, she returned to Waverly with her degrees in poetry and women's history. In 2001, she took an offer to teach poetry in prison and soon after founded the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Project with a staff of one, Caius. Today, 13 years later, the APAEP is based at Auburn University. With the support of the National Endowment of the Arts, the program has engaged more than 150 professors, graduate students, and visiting scholars who offer courses that range from engineering to theater to philosophy. We barrel down a two-lane road through Tallapoosa County. Caius knows every twist in the road and has a story for every detail in the landscape. So one of the things I tell people when we're driving around rural Alabama or anywhere in Alabama is everywhere you see right now was in cotton. And that means everywhere you see right now has been touched by slavery. And that context should not ever go away. You know, I think about it with my family land, right? It's like, slaves probably built this. I think it is important to acknowledge that when you consider the situation of the, the justice system right now, because there's definite correlations. After the Civil War, the justice system turned into an effective tool to disenfranchise and enslave minorities. Laws were created to allow the justice system to imprison for inconsequential infractions. So what happened, the relationship to the justice system is, is that if there was a black man walking along the street in, let's say, Tallapoosa County, then I just go to the cop and say, this person looked at me funny, right? And if as a white woman, right, if I make this assertion, there's a fairly reasonable chance that he's going to be arrested and he's probably going to be put into what is called the convict labor system. And this is where businesses would rent um, convicts from cities and counties to do manual labor work. Um, and, and they were treated horrifically. The system of slavery is horrific. 
But the economics of that system meant that if someone had purchased slaves, then they made the necessary economic investment into maintaining that life because there was an economic investment into a work outcome, right? All that went out the window with the convict labor system. Caius becomes quiet. Instead of another farmhouse, the Elmore Correctional Facility appears through the morning fog. Prisoners in white uniforms paced the circumference of a Constantine wire fence. Others stand around a yard about half the size of a soccer field. Caius tells me no wallets are allowed in prison and to tuck mine under the seat. Then she asks, Have you been in a prison before? Never. Okay. So by the end of your time on this trip, you are going to have a certain sadness that sits inside of you about prisons. And it will not ever leave, right? Because you're going to go meet with my students for three days. And in those three days, you're going to form a connection with them because they are incredibly likable people and very engaged and they're memorable. And um, that's going to sit in you. Well, you know, multiply that times 10 facilities a semester all over the state times 15 years, right? Okay, here we are at... This is Elmore Correctional Facility. Um, We are in Elmore, Alabama. And there are probably about 12 or 1,300 men crammed into that space. In the afternoons when it's warm, there's tons of people out on the yard. And uh, the class we're gonna, you're going to give is? Uh, this is a, a poetry writing class with a twist. Before entering the front building, Kaya signals that I need to turn off my recorder. Two officers sit in front of an airport-like security system. We're told to lay our things on a worn Formica table. I notice a fishnet bag of books on the table with Of Mice and Men, and their eyes were watching God poking through. The door to the bathroom swings open. A man more smile than face, tall enough to step across the room in two strides, drops his bundled white prison uniform, signs a paper, and seems not to register the officer's intonation. You behave yourself now. Caius and I peer through the window obscured by dust and cobwebs. A woman stands in front of her pickup, her arms outstretched. Caius murmurs to me, In all the years I've been working here, I've seen this far too seldom. The woman and man embrace. The officer signals that we can go into the facility. This is Paul. Paul's from Germany. But he's not originally from Germany. Nine students Uh, nod hello while helping to set up uh, chairs. The men represent the ethnic population of the prison. Five are black, three are white, and one is Hispanic. While chatting with the students, I'm struck by how words feel different in prison. Everyday words like internet, plane ticket, menu, seem grossly decadent. Kaya starts with a playful writing exercise. She gives them the beginning of a sentence to complete by writing a chain of comparisons. My brother's car smells like... Just to get our creative juices flowing a little bit. So, um, David, can we start with you? Yeah. Oh, okay. (laughs) Oh, you got your mouthful of cookies. We can start this way. Oh, we can go ahead. We're good. My brother's car smelled like yesterday's garbage. Like a bag of corn chips. Awful. Like a moor. A football team locker room. A rotten vegetable. Like the end of life. The trail to hell. Like chitlins not prepared. Oh my god. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Can we all get a sense of what this smells like? All right, Paul. Paul. Brother car smelled like old dirty clothes and spoiled food and shoes that ran a mile. What's the most specific detail? Old food. The ran a mile. The shoes that ran a mile, right? <laughs> okay, so that that is pointing to something very, very specific. And so what happens is you giving your description and you giving your description, all of you, you're triggering memories in other people. 
And that's the amazing, one of the many amazing things about writing. That's how you make human connections because you're saying, I've had this experience in my life. I've had this memory in my life. And I know that this is going to trigger something in you. The assigned book is Peter Heller's post-apocalyptic novel, Dog Stars, a story about two men struggling to survive in a futuristic landscape full of disease and thugs, a climate Miss Stevens feels not foreign to the prisoners. While discussing how the main character enters his burning house to save his poems rather than pictures of his dead wife, the class becomes lively. Caius asks what it means to save the poems. What are you going to say? He risked your life if the end of the world is happening. He risked his life probably to go back. He totally risked his life for poetry and soda pop. I felt like Melissa was gone and the poems are there. Okay, so what you have just said is what I would say the most beautiful commentary that you can possibly make about why the hell write a poem. We lose things all the time, right? And what remains are memories and what we write about them, (laughs) right? That here is this human being who needs more than a photograph of his dead wife, right? Poetry. It's a poem of somebody that's not home, that yearns to be where he calls home. Uh, very intense questions. What is home? Home is behind a rifle. You okay, a so, rifle part of, per, so part of what we're saying is that the concept of home is tied to an idea of comfort, of um, familiarity. As the discussion finishes, I sense an undercurrent that is unique to this environment. There's an urgency to concepts like home, memory, loss, masculinity. During the break, Andrew approaches me. Prison is a, is a uh, cross-cultural, social, anthropological uh, petri dish. It's a mix in a, in a controlled uh, environment. This is a prey predator environment. This is a violent environment. This is a drug infested environment. This is an infectious disease environment. This is an overcrowded environment. This is a uh, anti intellectual environment. This is a gang environment. There's racism. That's what prison is. Only four students come back after the break. Karan, Henry, and Tara sit with Andrew around the white plastic tables. I glance at the chapel walls lined with children's paintings of Jesus, two guards in a corner with radios blasting watch as a group of prisoners stack chairs. The students don't seem to be distracted by the racket. I ask, What does writing poetry mean to you while living in these harsh conditions? What I want is this, this place between the creative mind and, and dealing with life here. Um. We have, we have a lot of issues dealing with like family and real life issues, like dealing with loss and dealing with grief and learning how to describe the grief, what does grief look like. And me seeing that and trying to see it and explain, it gives me the vocabulary to actually explain what's going on with me and dealing with issues in my, in my very life by being in prison myself. So I can re-identify with society and what society, you know what I'm saying, wants. From me, you yeah. know what I'm saying? That's yeah. a part of the question I guess posed. You know uh, do, do you have a, mm-hmm. a poem or, or a, a few sentences? Oh, yeah, I got, I got as, one called um, Inside of Me. Does um, he have a poem? Uh, I, I, I like this one. No, I like this one. It's called um, In the Mirror. And it's very reflective. And it goes, I look in the mirror and I view my physical presence, taking in myself from the world's perspective of who I am, but what I really am is not seen for this bound inside of this physical presence. I wonder would ever be a mirror to reflect to the world from the perspective of how I view myself, of how I see myself, then the world can see me as I now only know myself. We as people spend hours in the mirror making up the person we want the world to see, never find the confidence of what's in the mirror, because what's in the mirror we know is make-believe, but the person we are, we hate to see, because the very individual that we need to be, the only way we can see is we see ourselves in the mirror like we ought to be. <laughs> in the mirror. I clap yeah. with my heart. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. It's just some things that I reflect on, just dealing with, you know, how the world sees me and what I want people to think of me. You know, being a felon and being in this position. When so, did you write that? I wrote that a couple of years ago, um, right at the loss of my grandmother. 
especially being a man, you know, we don't talk to people like I got this going on. You know, we like to hold it in, and the only way you really can deal with it if is if I could write it down. I, I talked to you for a minute. Um, coming out here to this class uh, is. I, I told someone yesterday when I got back to the dorm that it felt like I was coming from the outside, you know, out in society, back, you know, to prison. It's like an escape. Um, I've never been a, a poet, but now, you know, it's my mind is opening up to it. Like I wrote a poem about my grandmother. Uh, I, stuff I never thought I would get out of this class is, is coming out, you know, just... You know, feelings and stuff. Right. Get that pump for us here. It's, a, it's his decision whether he wants to. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Okay. I can, anything, I can read. Anything I ask for, you I'll can read, read it. I'll read it for you. It's all cool. Yeah. <laughs> Title was Nanny and I on a summer day. A tiny ball of cotton floats over her garden, pulling me like a John Deere. A plastic bucket holds her trophies. Rubber boots make a fashion statement. Eyes shine like stars. Pole beans snap easy. God bless the pea sheller. Mason jar holds plum nilly. Cotton top says, cows laying down. Cows don't know. Blue worms are magic. Red winged blackbird sings to a cat's tail. Snake doctor on my last eye. Through the head into the fat body. Toothpick through the eye. Cows laying down. Cotton Top believes that stuff. Blue worms are magic. They hang around the brush. I hang in the brush. Rats make a nest in my reel. Cows laying down laughing. Stupid cows don't know. See, there he is now. Fight like a champ, walking on water. No spitting, please. A nylon string holds my trophies. Blue worm magic. Stand up, dumb cow. Cotton top dancing, electric knife boogie, eyes shine like stars, our plates hold our trophies, taste buds happy laughing, her eyes shine like stars. Thank you. <laughs> eyes shine like stars. Her eyes, are just, uh, I have pictures of her, they were always just, just bright shining, uh, especially when she's happy. And especially, you know, if I'd bring in a, a mess of fish, you know, she just, you know, that would just make her day. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I've never written poetry before. Uh, and a matter of fact, I'm a very poor writer. But I began writing once attending these classes. And so uh, I've, I've come a long way. I was able to get uh, something, something published at one time from a, a, uh, the Michigan University Press in a book entitled Four City Essays from America's Prisons in February of 2014. I had an article in there that was entitled Mass Producing Mentally Ill Citizens in America's Prisons. I want to read just one paragraph, if I may. And this alludes to what Quran had talked about when he said in his point what we ought to be, he talked about his grandmother, and unfortunately, your listeners could not see the reddening and the, and the tearing in his eyes, nor could you with Henry talking about his loved ones as well. And fears, basic human fears, you know, include loss of love. Let me just read this, if I, if I might, Paul. This says uh, from the book, Humans are highly adaptable to extremes of both negative and positive environments. This adaptability is first and foremost seated in the mind. The mind defines who the person is, and every thought of the mind is reducible to the neuronal cell unit. That is, the mind is the brain and is made up of approximately 100 billion neurons. The adaptability of the brain is referred to as plasticity. When the brain changes, the individual is changed. So one of my greatest fears of being in prison is the adaptability which I might become in response to this environment. Uh, to put it more bluntly, I'm afraid of becoming a monster because of having been here for over a decade. I'm, I, that, that scares me. And as I get older, I feel that I might become more susceptible to that, understanding the stress upon me and the degree of, of which uh, dementia may set in an older age. The poetry gives me something to, uh, to strive for. And you had, um, you had asked um, what this program means to us, right? 
in the creative mind yeah, and the prison aspect. Life here. And I've been locked up so long. I'm loved but forgotten. Uh, when I started really diving into uh, me as a person and I wrote my mom um, a Mother's Day poem. I wrote all the feelings I had about my life and growing up and I turned it all into how I was affected by life and how my mother was there and how she, sometimes she wasn't there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it brought up an emotion that I've never seen in my mother. And she was shocked and surprised and, and felt loved all in the same time. Do you remember what she said to you? Oh, she, she said, she told me, she said, I, I can't believe that you felt like that. And throughout the whole poem, I cried. Oh. How we? Take a break for just a second. We got, okay. Well, they may have to shit, go. Shit. Oh, no. So you have to, so you have to go somewhere or we yeah, just? We have to go back to the dorm because they can't, they can't clear the count. It's on their rack where everybody's one, two, three, right in a row. You have to go to your bed assignment so they can count you like, you know, A's in the car. Well, I hope I see you in a second. 15 minutes to an hour. So. I'm here for you guys all the way from Germany. I'll be here. I hope, you'll, I hope you will advocate to keep your time that you were you were insured that you would have. And we certainly want that time. An hour later, only three poets return. Henry and Andrew click back into discussion mode, recalling childhood experiences that blocked learning. Although they're from contrasting backgrounds, Koran is black and from inner city Birmingham, Henry is white and from the countryside, they both have similar views about education and social structure. The mysterious undercurrent of meaning that I felt during the class reveals itself. Um, what, what keeps people from wanting to do poetry or something like that? And I can go back to my seventh grade year. Um, a band director came to me and asked me about being in the band. And so I, I was learning to play the trumpet. And the band director told me, he, he would go up there on the piano and hit a note and ask the class what note was that. I was the only one in the class that could tell him the notes. And he said I had a, a very good musical ear. But um, some of my family... Why aren't you playing football, you know? And, and even the, the coach at the school I was going to, um, he approached me and said, what are you doing in that beginning band? You're supposed to be out here playing football. So it, they shamed me out of, and I, I really loved playing that trumpet. After that year, the next year, I went out for football and, and never played the trumpet again. Mm. What we consider education to be is getting, getting knowledge. A lot of them don't know. You know, it's like coming from a, the culture that I come from, the background that we come from, people are not, it's, it's not popular to be the smartest guy in the class. Where does that come from, right? Because I would agree that part of it is absolutely cultural, right? But if you are talking about making a cultural shift. The, one of the barriers in the shifts is this, how I see it is like, um, <clears throat> you have identity with things. Like when you come from our community that we come from in the inner city of Birmingham, we don't have wrestling teams, we don't have debate teams, like you see on TV. We don't know about poetry in itself, so that's why we don't understand it. We don't, we never been told our ideals are worth anything. So a lot of people say, you're gonna write your ideas down. Well, write down for, you know. I don't know nobody that's a male that come from my neighborhood. They graduated high school. None of us. Before I even graduated ninth grade, I was in prison. Taurus wanders in while we're wrapping up. Before coming to Alabama, I asked Caius if I could give a workshop where the students recite their poems and I play music. This is my last chance to try out the idea, so I take out my trumpet. Taurus needs a bit of encouragement. You look at you. Yeah, I just, I'm just, I feel I'm this, nervous. I, I just, I'm I not. I that we all support you. Yeah. I'm not a type of person that, that usually expresses himself in front of a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? I'm We're like, you know what I'm saying? We're not even listening. <laughs> No. Okay. Let's, let's do this. I'll leave you space. You mm -hmm. leave me space. I'll play. Like I said before, I'll play, and then you just write on top of the note. Let's do one word, one note, one word until it needs two words or two notes. Oh, so you... <laughs> Let it grow slowly. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in the depths of my stomach, where the pain prays and shocks, 
You left me like it was nothing. Now the shame, it never stops. Mug me, smear me while humming. Lonely tear, my heart just rots. The ugly fear keeps coming. Now the doors are always locked. But your beauty was stunning. And your lips, they got me high. I was higher than a comet with an angel in the sky. Search the trees, scan the seas, burning down to third degrees. My destiny ran from me, now I'm praying on my knees. Using me, but I was using you. Puppets acting dumb. What did I do to you? The usual. Nothing. Actions numb. I wonder what it all means. Pinch myself, am I still asleep? Under a spell of a queen, and my slumber plunders me. Thank you. Elmore Facility parking lot opens up to a field with a compost mountain about a half a mile away. A tractor driven by a smiling prisoner heads for the compost. Those on work patrol are allowed this little bit of freedom. I glance back at the facility one last time, then at the narrow road leading out. Caius is already in the car organizing her program, answering emails. No, take, take, totally take your time. I'm discombobulated. Well, they don't like it when we loiter in the parking lot. So let me get to another location and we will regroup. If you're loitering in the parking lot, it suggests that you're doing something that you shouldn't be. Got it. I am so happy with Henry's breakthrough on his poem today that I could just about freaking pop. <laughs> So here's this guy, right? Here's this guy who signs up for a class because he is absolutely desperate to have an opportunity to just think differently, right? And to be into a different place. And he gets me as his poetry teacher. Poetry to me is about seeing first. Seeing first, then paying attention to language, and then coming back and working on are we gonna push this into a form or something like that, right? It is first and foremost, the way of living. And if you are somebody who spends a lot of time in nature, you are already a poet. He didn't recognize it in himself. He did the day. Well, he was re reading this tender, tender poem about, you know, his grandma, and the officer's radio in the background, just <laughs> That's the sound of prison, and that's the sound of trying to survive in prison. The human need to, to write a poem, to make a piece of art, is so fundamental and so important to our existence on this planet that they can, through every awful circumstance of the prison, they can still do it. I don't struggle to find a piece of paper. Yeah. I don't have to sell myself to get a dictionary. Right? And it's, I mean, the, the people who are in our program who are visual artists, I remember a guy telling me that he would get up at 3 o'clock, between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, and he would sit on the floor and draw because that was the only flat surface that he had. And in the middle of the night when everybody is sleeping is the only time that he could work on his drawings without anybody messing with him. Okay, yeah. How many artists do you know that that struggle with that, right? We stopped for a snack in downtown Auburn. During our conversation, I didn't realize how loud the cafe had gotten, so I'll help tell the next story. A student in an art class was desperately trying to finish a large painting and... Literally, the officer is standing at the door, tapping on the door with his baton, because at this point, we've been there for six and a half hours, and we're in the way, and we're messing things up. And they're working on these four-by-six, three-by-six, huge drawings, paintings. 
The other students notice him struggling to finish the painting. They ask him if they can help him finish. He replies, okay, but don't mess it up. He gives them something that they can do and work on and repeat the pattern. The thing that's amazing about these classes is the teachers are creating opportunity and space not only for I found Kaya's statement so pertinent to this feature that I'd like to repeat what she says apart from the din of the cafe. Keep somebody out of prison, it's not because they learned Teachers are creating opportunity not only for learning, not only for creating, but for human beings to invest in each other. If you want that shift that's going to happen that eventually keeps somebody out of prison, it's not because they learn to write a poem. It's because they learn how to interact with human beings through writing the poem, or drawing, or talking about a piece of literature. Creativity becomes a mechanism to embrace and accept each other. Happening right now, the St. Clair Correctional Facility on lockdown tonight. We're told an officer was stabbed while trying to break up a fight between two inmates. We're also told that officer's injuries were not life-threatening. Lydia, who looked into how the stab... Needless to say, the next day, visiting the theater class at St. Clair Correctional Facility is canceled. Instead, Caius takes me around rural Alabama to describe the interplay of the land and the justice system. Harpersville is one of a couple of towns in, in Alabama that is... Pretty, pretty notorious for putting people in jail for traffic violations because they couldn't pay their fines. This was a money-making mechanism for this town. And people who couldn't pay the $50 ticket would get hundreds of dollars in fines on top of that ticket. They, couldn't, they can't pay the $500 in fees because they couldn't pay the $25 ticket or whatever it was. Then they would lock these folks up. <laughs> That business, that that is the prison industrial complex, right? And it is absolutely exploiting poor people. While listening to Caius talk about Alabama's difficult history, I was curious to know what brought her back home after living in New York. After all, the name of her story is Growing Hope. I miss the soil, I miss the smells, I miss the sound, I miss walking in the woods at night. When I asked her to describe the beauty of Alabama, she referred to a Langston Hughes poem. I woke up this morning thinking about this Langston Hughes poem called Daybreak in Alabama. I love this poem, and uh... When I get to be a composer, I'm gonna write me some music about Daybreak in Alabama, and I'm gonna put the prettiest songs in it, rising out of the ground like a swamp mist and falling out of heaven like soft dew. I'm gonna put some tall, tall trees in it and the scent of pine needles and the smell of red clay after rain and long red necks and poppy-colored faces and big brown arms and the, the field of daisy eyes and black and white, black, white, black people. And I'm gonna put white hands and black hands and brown hands and yellow hands and the clay earth hands in it, touching everybody with kind fingers and touching each other natural as do. And that dawn of music, I get to be a We will I be true to thee. South wind whispers, thy magnolia grows among softer than a mother's kiss, sweeter than a mother's song. Where the golden jasmine trailing, who's the treasure laden be? Before visiting the art class at the Tutwiler Prison for Women, I go to Montgomery to talk with Senator Ward. Cam Ward is a Republican state senator who recently passed a bill to spend $800 million to tear down old prisons and build four new supersized prisons. This decision has been made partly in reaction to the federal government threatening to take over. I ask him, why is it such a struggle to improve justice system policy? We tend to oversimplify the criminal justice system sometimes. Bad, put them in a box and lock the door. Good, you walk out free. We like black and white. There's a cowboy, there's an Indian. When you get into the murky world where 
80% is gray. Americans don't like that as much. That's why we're real big on bumper, I call them bumper sticker slogans. One sentence explains the entire policy of criminal justice. It sells on votes, but it doesn't necessarily make good policy. And going into to that statement, the, the reasons why the justice system is what it is today as far as the problems? I think some of our um, lawmaking and social for lack of a better word, social engineering that we do as a country has sometimes created a, a discrepancy that probably does impact one group over another. good example being the um, sentencing guidelines, discrepancies between crack cocaine and powder cocaine. You know, crack cocaine's cheaper. Your demographically much poorer population, which tends to be African-American, uses more crack cocaine than the powder cocaine. Powder cocaine tended to be more of a um, uh, upper echelon, upper class drug. So what happened was you you, you pay, spent more time in, in jail for crack cocaine than you did for powder cocaine. Well, what happened is you had more people who were poor using crack cocaine, so disproportionately they got sentenced already. And that's a, that's a very overly simplified one. But there are situations like that. I don't think there was ever anyone out there saying, let's go get the poor, let's go get this group. Statistics so. tell us that 26% of Alabama is African-American, but its prison population is 54%. Thank you very, very much. Yes. broad and fertile where thy snow white cotton shine town that I live in, I love it, and it drives me crazy. Um, when you talk to the good white people of Waverly, Alabama, they will tell you that there are two churches in our town. There are not two churches in our town. There are at least, in the community of Waverly, there are at least five churches, but they only talk about the white churches. That is inherent systemic racism. That's a complete dismissal, right? And then that is the, the energy that exists in this state that people just ignore. The next day, we're in the car headed to Tutwiler Prison for Women. Julia Tutwiler has a woman's prison named after her because in the early 1900s, she established higher education for women in Alabama and advocated penal education, healthcare, and separate prisons for men and women. She died with the nickname Angel of Prisons, and by the way, the lyrics to the Alabama State song that we're hearing was written by her. In 2013, Tutwiler Prison was documented to be one of America's worst prisons. Its officer on prisoner abuse became a national scandal and a new warden was brought in. Over a hundred years after Julia Tutwiler lived, we're visiting the facility because an art class is allowed to paint a mural on a wall in the multi-purpose room. Slow progress is better than none. Well, I remember what months ago, I think, we talked about this mural being made, and you said... We have officers come in and tell us how great it looks. One woman came in the other day and told the ladies, she says, this just looks incredible. I went to the mountains in my dream last night. So yeah, that was just like this beautiful, like, moment of endorsement and appreciation and thankfulness. All right, there's no parking here. How big is this prison? It's probably between seven and 800 women who are incarcerated here. Yeah, okay, well, I'm gonna get out of the car and turn this off. Okay, no cell phone. Nope. I'm gonna check through my backpack to make sure I don't have anything before talking with the Tutwiler art students, I'm able to interview the new warden, Bobby Barrett. Sitting at his desk in front of piles of paperwork, Warden Barrett seems surprised when I tell him I heard about the art class mural all the way in Berlin, Germany. I asked him what his considerations were when signing off on the project. Kai approached me about would I be in favor if they did a mural, and of course my first response was, well, let's, uh, what kind of mural? Because um, certainly I didn't want anything that could be inflammatory or, uh, you know, uh, could be a security risk, you know, mm -hmm. uh, gang activity. Uh, yeah. I will say that, it, that uh, it's almost an, uh, an arm to the outside. An uh, arm to the outside. Uh, that they're being able to utilize some of their talents. It covers the whole wall, and you'll see it, that it's uh, what we call our old dining hall. It used to be the old dining hall. But... Uh, it's impressive. Do you think about the risk bringing supplies in? You know, the security side of you think, okay, 
Stands. You know, the wrong one get a hold of the paint, you know, they could color the uniform, hit the fence, or skate. Thank you very much. Warden Barrett gives me permission to record entering the facility. The acoustics of prison tell their own story. In a room about the size of a small high school gym, a handful of art students in white are painting a wall-to-wall -wall mountain range. This is the room where prisoners receive visitors, and even the restroom doors labeled guest and inmate are painted over green and grassy, scattered with flowers, rivers, and cats. Caius points. Right there, a student. Hi. Hi. I'm Paul. Hi, Paul. Nice to meet you. I'm nice Lila. This is a huge mountain range. Isn't it awesome? Like the Alps or the, I don't know, the Appalachians? What mountains are these? Just mountains in our head, I guess. It has been so much fun, and it's kind of therapeutic, and it's been a great learning experience, but we never realized the magnitude of this wall until we started it. We wanted to go all the way around the room. <laughs> you going to do it? Uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> no. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. Another artist introduces herself as Chainsaw. Recalling the warden's words about colors, I ask Chainsaw... You're not allowed to use color or paint, no color. like... No color here at all. The only color we see is on a nurse. Faye stands on a ladder to the far right of the mural. Instead of a tree, she paints a giant arm protruding from the side of the mountain. It's holding a paintbrush, which is painting the mountainside. To the left stands a lighthouse. I'm just not used to color. Those flowers mm -hmm. have been a million different colors. The water has been a million different colors. Um, I've been stuck in this corner, and it's changed and changed and changed. I just want to, I want people to see what I feel. Do you see that as something that moves in time? flow through different colors right. through your fit. Yeah. Right. Tell me about what inspired you to change it. Mountains are symbolic of strength. Right. And you have all this strength and you have all this stability and you have the flow and you have everything. And I just wanted to say you are able to create your own destiny. You are able to paint your own story. You know what I'm saying? So freedom is not about walking outside this prison. Freedom is about when you're outside of this prison being free. You see what I'm saying? So it's like I tell people every day, just because you're ready to go don't mean you're ready to go. You have the time mm -hmm. to go ahead and recreate yourself. So it's more than just being, it's, it's more than putting pretty stuff on the wall. It's more than just, it's more than just paint and colors, you know what I'm saying? It's more than just taking the white off. It's saying, it's saying we're here and we're mothers and we're daughters and we're wives and we're sisters, but we're also artists. Just and don't forget about us, because we're here. We are here. It's like they threw us in a dungeon, threw away the key. Mm -hmm. Well, let's paint the walls of the dungeon, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Do you have kids? I have four boys. How old are they, if I may ask? Um, 23, 22, 13, and 11. Wow, that's yes. sweet. And then they must find that awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very conscientious about having people come in and record our program, right? Because people, the general public, wants a sound bite for what it means to be in prison. And those are not sound bites to me. Those are my students. And the risk of our class, for any of our creative classes, is that you, when you are creating, when you are making art, when you are in a space that we create, it is very hard to ignore the things that you miss. It's very hard not to be aware of what you do not have because in the creative process, your mind is thinking about everything. 
So the students who participate in our classes and the ones who persevere all the way through the end, I mean, it's, it's, it's an intense act for them. It's a, it's a full-on human investment. Why shouldn't we know somebody who's incarcerated? What, why shouldn't we understand how they got to where they got, right? If you tie in so much not worrying about the body or worrying about pleasure or running from pain, if you just experience life on life's terms and you, you chase knowledge and the, the knowledge of your soul and, and what's good for you, then these problems won't happen. These seemingly unimportant decisions that lead you down the wrong path won't happen because you would, you'll have the power to pause, to pause, think about stuff. Don't just be reactive. You could be proactive. We're talking with philosophy students at the Donaldson Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison not far from Birmingham. To get a feeling for the course, let's listen to a short segment of Katie Rosning's class, Language, Logic, Power, Introduction to Philosophy. What connections do you guys see between the ideas of Socrates and Plato, and maybe even Aristotle, and Descartes' project as he begins to outline it in these meditations? He believed, well, basically all of them believed in reason. They believed that the actual truth about whatever questions that they're asking could be found dealing with reason and only through reason. Good. Okay, we'll, I'll stop you there. McKeithen. Descartes, Descartes and Socrates both went on somewhat of a quest in search of knowledge. And um, that's one similarity. And um, with, with Descartes, he broke away by refusing to like, you know, he wanted to doubt everything. I believe Socrates, uh, they still believe that, uh, well, Socrates that man don't know everything, you know, that he's, he feel that he's so wise because he realized that he don't know nothing. But Descartes, Descartes, he's going to doubt everything. He's going to start from scratch, you know, because I don't, I don't, he didn't trust the Middle Ages. He really didn't, didn't trust, even though Socrates, Plato, they was, you know, some, some, you know, they, they laid the groundwork. But he, he wanted to just, no, I'm going to start from the ground and just bypass what they was talking about and, and just try to come to the root of it myself. Yeah. And by doing that, um, but he, um, he kind of tripped me out when he started with just doubt everything. After then class, said, no, we meet Miss Rosning in a cafe. When she finished her undergraduate work at the University of Chicago, she went to the University of Alabama to pursue a master's in creative writing. The prison arts and education project drew her to Alabama. How would you compare teaching in the university to teaching in prison? Um, and in terms of, I don't know, teaching on, on the Alabama campus is really hard after teaching classes in the prisons because my students in the prisons are so much more interesting. Um, they ask so much, they ask just much more interesting questions. They're not interested in a grade. They're interested in <laughs> the truth, right? The subject matter. The subject matter, yeah. And, and they, they're, they're motivated to think about complicated, difficult problems in a way that um, exceeds you know, kind of the brass rings of academic meritocracy or whatever. Um, and I, I really, it's, it, so the, the teaching experience is just so much richer and more compelling and it feels like the stakes are much higher. So I have a good anecdote for you on that. When I read Socrates as an undergraduate, I never stopped to wonder if he was a bit of an asshole, <laughs> right? That just never occurred to me because my teachers were these, you know, silverback academics, deeply accomplished, editing anthologies of ancient Greek philosophic dialogues and stuff. Um, and they worshiped Socrates, and I got the message very clearly that I too should worship Socrates, right? Um, I bring in a Socratic dialogue to my students at Donaldson, you know, like in the class that you observed earlier today, and my students want to talk about what a jerk Socrates is. And they really are like deeply skeptical of his character, of his philosophical project. Um, they, they identify him as a bully, which is absolutely true, but I had never been prompted to to consider his character in that way before. Um, and that's, you know, you heard us comparing Socrates to Donald Trump. Um, again, it's very strange bedfellows that I would never have made that connection with before, but they did. What was it like, your first experience coming into a prison and, and, and teaching? Um, well, I would say that, I mean, the first time you go into a prison, 
it's 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 a complicated feeling to talk about in some ways because on one hand I was so amazed by how normal and ideal the classroom conversation was it was it was just an amazing kind of uh, classroom discussion to witness the first time I went in. Um, on the other hand, it's like deeply shattering <laughs> um, to go into a, a prison facility. Um, I mean, going through gates and uh, seeing the ways that just the building is designed to um, to to influence human movement um, is is just very difficult to witness. So on one hand, my feeling was just delight and kind of being surprised at how normal the classroom conversation was, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word to use. Um, but I remember leaving and stopping at a gas station just you know a couple miles down the road and, and watching people come and go from the gas station and just being flabbergasted that they could come and go whenever they wanted. <laughs> and that was just like really difficult. Um, so that was my first, like, emotional kind of polarity experience of going into an institution. Let's conclude our visit at Donaldson by asking some of the students how they connect philosophy and learning to life in a maximum security prison. Prison is almost a, a, a revolving door, so the, the population, it grows and grows. It's something wrong with that, and I think it ties into philosophy because... Even Socrates, Plato, all of the great philosophical minds, they felt like if you know better, you'll do better. A lot of things that lead us in, we, we don't have conflict resolution skills. We're not good social people, but the class provides us a, a venue. It inspires you to pass that on. Are the younger people coming in receptive? Practically every class is that, that, all, that all it brings. What we do with the material we get, we spread it out to other guys. And some will take it in, into the influence, you know, the peer pressure, because it's by we older, well, you don't want that old guy telling you what to do. Then they'll see you after they bang their head a couple of times, so to speak. They'll come back around and say, hey, man, what was you that you was telling me? So, hey, uh, let's try it again. These Auburn classes, so we, they go back like 2007, and we've been taking them, and they have groomed us to who we are today. We weren't always these good little guys, you know, but they have groomed us to our, how, who we are today. And so when we talk to young guys or certain guys, they see us in certain classes, they see, they like, oh, I want to get in there, I don't want to sign up, you know, and, and also because of the teachers that are bringing him. Uh, Katie Ross, they're one of the best ones, and she challenged you, you know. We've been locked up so long and got a lot of fresh guys coming in. It's a gap there. And so now, how can we step to them and communicate with them when we know they're uneducated? And because we was at that stage, too. And so now, that's the opportunity I get out of this, and enjoyment as well. It's coming in and learning and, and going back and giving. If you don't want to do nothing, you ain't got to do nothing. And so now, a lot of guys we see finna go back to the street. But when they go back to the street, less than a year, they were on their way back because we know, hey man, you ain't listen to me and you didn't learn nothing. So now when you're getting out, you ain't prepared. So basically we're preparing ourselves in here and to help the environment and to help society, even on the guys that are getting out. And so we're looking to get out as well because things changing. So now what are you prepared for, success or failure? It's, it's not so much as how fast a, a person gets here or, or, or when they get it, it's about planting the seed and, and, and watering that seed because, you know, it, nothing is instant in life. Even though we live, in, at least in America, we live in this instant society. Most of the times that's what leads us to prison, trying to do things the easy and fast way, but that's not reality. We don't look look at the ideas that we feed ourselves, or the belief, belief systems that we think we have or that we feel we have. And this is why philosophy is important because in questioning these belief systems that have been marketed and fed to us in a way, but they're not realistic perceptions. Can you tell me how learning here affects your life on a daily basis? This learning experience is kind of tripping me out. And I went to this one art class and I, I never thought I could draw a face. I've been locked up 33 years. And from like maybe 20 years or so, over 25, I've been trying to draw, I couldn't do it. But I went to this Auburn art class and the first day, this 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 teacher just uh, Lisa just said some words to me. Next thing I know, bam, I'm drawing a face, and now I'm like, 
it amazes me every time I draw something, I still can't believe that I'm doing this when so I tried so long to do it. So, uh, but then, and also, because of the art class that Auburn brought, I'm now teaching a beginner's art class. Guys see me drawing and they be like, man, I want to learn how to do that. And I just teach them what she taught me. And Kai's, uh, I mean, she's actually been like a lifesaver to a lot of us. A lot of guys in here with these classes she's bringing. I'm pretty much learning uh, patience and accepting life on life terms. And I have to deal with it. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, considering this not being a victim, but being a victor. And, you know, overcoming whatever circumstance is thrown at me. Because sometimes you can't. You, you can't let your circumstance or your environment affect you. You got to affect the environment and, you know. From victim to victor. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> you gave me that. Thank you. All knowledge is plagiarism. It comes from somewhere. <laughs> you know, everybody takes knowledge and passes on. How does what you're doing now affect the, the family or friends who knew you from before? Family, they sometimes they find it hard to, be, to believe this change in me. But yet, the, my nieces and nephews now, who didn't know me, didn't know me growing up, they like, you know, uh, uh, Uncle Ron. I love Uncle Ron. Uncle Ron's a nice guy, you know. But my sister, sometimes they be like, they want to trust, they want to trust it because I used to have these anger issues, particularly for folks that you know hurt my family or whatever. But uh, the, the change is, is, they loving it, you know. They enjoying it. I'm, I'm affecting them too, and they're making changes in their lives too, you know. When I got locked up. My little sister, she's about three years old. So now she in her 30s and she done wrote a book. And through, you know, through corresponding and talking with her. So that's one of the positive things. Then my sister, other older sister, you know, they said, well, look what, look what you done accomplished now. Just think if you behave yourself, where you be at now. <laughs> Before meeting Emily, an ex-Alabama prison arts and education program student, Let's find out some hard facts about art and recidivism. I'm Larry Brewster, professor of public administration and former dean of the College of Professional Studies at the University of San Francisco. According to your research, what are Emily's chances of staying out of prison? In 1987, it's the only recidivism study that I know of in, in the United States based on uh, arts programs. 74% of arts and corrections participants had clean records the first year after release compared with only 49% for other parolees. What they also found, and this is quite noteworthy, is that the longer the um, ex-offenders were out of prison, the more likely that the arts and corrections participants would still be on good behavior compared with the average or non-arts and corrections participants. For instance, within two years of release, 58% of the non-arts and corrections participants were in trouble compared with only 31% for the arts and corrections ex-cons. This is kind of a perfect place to meet, in the open. There are no fences. There's fresh air. There are no guard shacks. There's sunshine up above. You can actually look out any window you want to or step outside and watch the sunrise or watch the sunset. There's fountains, ducks, dogs. You can see the pup parade. When Emily was released from Tutwiler, she found it difficult to go back to her hometown where everybody knew her as the ex-con. So she found a whole new city and started afresh. Emily suggested meeting at the main park because it's a wide open space, a good contrast to her 16 years within the gray and white Tutwiler confines. The thing about being incarcerated, you're dehumanized. You, there's, there's no room for personality. Um, you're given a number that is you. It's really hard to, to gather that your identity back. So when Kai's came in, the first class I took with was in 2003, we were not a group of convicts. We were a class. We were individuals. We, it didn't matter what, that we were in white uniforms. Did it affect your relationships with other students? I had people who had their, their street cred in prison 
um, who came across as the toughs, the bullies, uh, you know, the butchers, whatever. And so they would come into class and all of a sudden you see a totally different person. You see the creative person. You see the beautiful person that's buried underneath all this, the masks, the, you know, the posturing. So, but the thing about it is there was the respect that whatever happened in class stayed in class. There were, there were no boundaries. There were no races. But when you go back out on the hall, all those walls came right back up. How do you see the art and the poetry teachers who come into prison to teach? For an instructor who has no vested interest for real, there's no personal gain to go inside those gates. For them to step outside of their comfort zone, to come into... A hostile environment, because that's exactly what it is, not necessarily just the inmates, but there's a lot of the staff in the administration who don't want to see anything that's good for an inmate. So you look at the teacher as as kind of an activist, too, because you know that person is there because they love their art, they love poetry. Right. And also, there are the voices of the incarcerated to be carried outside the fences. Inmates correspondence, whether it's letters, phone calls, whatever, everything, all the communications from one side of the fence to the other are monitored. So even if you're talking to your mom or your, your child on the phone, these are recorded. So you can't really say what you really want to say. And you're always conscious of this? Yes. You're always aware of this? Yes. They, they make sure you're aware of it. So, so these instructors who come in, they are able to take the voices that they hear, the things that they see, and they are allowed to carry that out through, you know, such as like the anthology. We've had instructors who have came in who are like women's rights activists, feminists, that they take what they see and they hear and they carry it to the, to the world, to the public. So they're giving the inmates a voice. I'd like to thank Kaya Stevens for the time, energy, and thought she put into organizing my visit. Before entering the first prison class, she told me that I would acquire a sadness that would never go away. And she was right. But learning about the Arts and Education Project also instilled in me a sense of hope that I didn't have before coming to Alabama. Let's conclude with two anecdotes that tell us something about the person behind the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Project. The first story is from her hometown of Waverly, Alabama. The second is from after she graduated from the university when she was teaching on a wagon train for troubled youth. Several years ago, a kid, a black kid, stole a bike off of somebody's front porch here in town. And I remember everybody being so excited that the police came and toted off this 13 or 14 year old kid for stealing a bike. And my response was, why didn't you just give him the bike? You've just screwed up the rest of this kid's life. Obviously he can't get a bike. What if, what if you say, all right, how about you come work for me for the summer and earn some money and I'll buy you a bike? Why, why does your first response have to be, I have to punish you and show you how wrong you are? Um, yes, people make bad decisions daily, right? Everybody does. To, to, to think that there is a person out there that hasn't made mistakes, that's ridiculous. I was teaching remedial reading and writing, and I, I loved it. Um, and I remember this moment I was sitting on a bench and uh, one of my students is sitting right next to me, and he leans over and he puts his hand on my face, and he said, I could kill you right now. And, and it was this very just incredibly intense moment, and I said, I, yes, you can, and I don't think you're going to do that, All right? Um, and it was just, for me, it was like human beings suffer, Human beings struggle, and if you are not, if you do not grow up in a place where there is a support network, struggle consumes you, right? And it consumes you into, um, pushes people to criminal activity, right? It pushes people to addiction, Um 
And I think all of this stuff has just kind of been churning around in my head. So I didn't intend to start a, a prison education program in a prison. My, my thought was I, I get my MA in women's history. I get my MFA in poetry. I eventually go back and get a PhD and I teach at a university somewhere. And then this found me. <laughs> and um, as next to working with a volunteer fire department, I guess probably the most important thing I've done in my life. This is Paul Brody. Thanks for listening to my feature, Growing Hope, the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Project. Editing, mixing, and music by Brody, except the Alabama State song is sung by Rick Pickrens, and the Alabama Work song is from the Alan Lomax Collection. Christoph Bernowitz is featured on guitar. I'd like to thank Kaya Stevens and the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Project for having me, and especially all the students at Tutwiler, Elmore, and Donaldson. Bye now. <laughs>